as I said, this is Chris Irwin. I work for the Office of Electricity um, at, uh, at the Department of Energy. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, a little bit of the background on how we went um, assembling the state-specific reports on, on giving folks some planning considerations and some potential planning tools that they can use in this, in this journey towards transport electrification. Um, so I'm going to start out with just sort of the, the high-level things. Then my colleague Frank Tufner from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is going to talk about how PNNL used EVI Pro Light, which was developed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in creating the content for the reports. And then Jim Kuiper of Argonne National Laboratory is going to talk about how he used the Energy Zones mapping tool to create that. Our goal is to let you know that these are, um, in many cases, fairly straightforward tools that can help give you decision-making information back, especially if you add your own knowledge in, your own preferences into these tools. So with that, I'm gonna move forward in our deck, at least I believe so. Um, obviously, this, this transition towards uh, electrified transportation is underway. And I think one of the most challenging things that we're presented with is we don't know how fast and where it's going to be happening, um, but we do know it's going to be happening pretty fast, um, courtesy of customer choice and courtesy of federal funding. Um, but there is a big delta between um, what is, what's going to be happening in the real world. And so we need to try to figure out what tools can we use to get this look forward. Um, we know transport electrification is the largest projected new load growth um, in there, and it has very different operational characteristics. It represents um, a new domain uh, of research for us that we call sector coupling, is that what does it mean to have the electric system and the transportation system more tightly coupled than they used to be? Um, there's a lot of dimensions to that uh, that you will be going through as well. Um, Finally, it is new stakeholders. Uh, there are folks in the transportation domain who have never needed to care very much about electricity, and electricity has never really needed to account for transportation in many ways. And so we need to figure out how to grow together on this arrangement. Like I said, there is federal funding coming from the, the infrastructure bill um, on both sides of the of the sectors we have the tran clean transportation outlined here with the five billion from nevi um, two and a half billion additionally through them for other um, alternate fueling infrastructure uh, a low emissions grants program for transit and clean school buses so the transportation sector is seeing this transition and it has real dollars coming towards it in parallel with that, there's a grid modernization um, emphasis, and I'm showing you three different um, funding vehicles under the infrastructure bill that deal with grid modernization. Um, obviously, uh, the grid is going to be resilient relative to the load that it has, and so transport electrification has to be a part of that thinking. Um, and then finally, I wanted to point out uh, at the bottom there the smart grid investment grants, um, there's three billion there that explicitly includes electric vehicle integration and vehicle to grid technologies. And so we have a lot of stakeholders thinking about multiple funding sources to see through their own state agenda. Um, obviously the, elect the Office of Electricity is just a single office within the Department of Energy. We need to work with a lot of our peers, a lot of our partners inside the department to work with a lot of stakeholders outside the department. For that, we've actually created a new initiative called EV Grid Assist, um, which is, it helps us organize our internal efforts across the Office of Electricity, the Vehicle Technologies Office, um, the new um, joint office, which is a joint venture between the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy. Um, the Office of Technology Transition. So we have a lot of partners inside that we need to correspond with. And it's going to, of course, span the entire electric infrastructure. So while we're talking about these state reports today, it's a big picture and we're trying to do our best to be organized and present um, you know, digestible information for you. 
So I want to get right into talking about the state reports and how we went about creating them. Um, there are 51 of them. Um, we are capable of creating additional ones for the for the U.S. territories as well, um, based on based on need and interest and things like that. Um, since this is the Office of Electricity, we are highlighting the importance of the interdependencies with electric infrastructure. And we're, we demonstrated two free online self-service tools. Um, DOE has funded dozens of tools that are relevant in this area, but we wanted to highlight these two because they're the most approachable and really provide a lot of tangible decision-making criteria that we, we hope uh, you can find use for. Um, so the, the caveats that we put in place is that we're not, we're not really giving, we're not doing anybody's homework for them and we're, we're not telling people what to do. These are things that you can broadcast your own mission against. Um, we used the state specific information to show how these tools can be actively used for your specific state, for your specific issues and things like that. Um, the results are still high level. Um, what we hope to do through Frank's discussion today and through Jim's discussion today is to show you how you might be able to really rapidly customize these tools to take your own inputs and to take your own priorities into account. Um, and then finally, the other thing we'd like to leave you with, um, as, as many in the regulatory community already know, is that the partnership between departments of transportation, state energy offices, and the electricity community needs to intensify because we need a lot more detail to actually get these stations deployed, functioning, and highly reliable out in the real world. So we have these two tools that we're going to talk about. I am going to hand off to my colleague Frank Tuffner um, to talk about the EVI Pro Light components of the presentation. One thing that I will say is that uh, please feel free to chat in your questions. We're going to try to move through, through this material as efficiently as possible so that we can have actual Q&A and that I can open up the mics towards the end here because uh, helping you move forward on this is sort of our highest goal. So with that, I'll hand it off to Frank and go to your first slide. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm Frank Tuffner with the Pacific Northwest National Lab. I'm a power systems researcher here. And I'm gonna go over kind of the EVI Pro light analysis we put into the reports. Um, if you can go back to the previous slide, sorry, Chris. So something that we wanna kind of, oh, there we go, touch on with this is some of the main items we're interested in, especially from the electric grid side, are how is that gonna be influenced by this vehicle grid integration? And this slide kind of outlines some of the higher level aspects of that we wanna cover. And the big one, of course, is grid capacity. As all of these electric vehicles are coming onto the system, can the grid support them? What kind of issues will be in there? And you may have seen reports that are talking about, you know, there's enough generation, there's sufficient capacity to integrate these, but maybe there's some caveats on that. And that's what a lot of this kind of future technical assistant might, assistance might start looking at, especially in the context of where those constraints actually lie. And even if there is enough generation capacity, there might be some challenges getting the power from the generation plants, the coal plants, the wind turbines, things of that nature, down to the actual electric vehicles. And the, the figure on the right there kind of shows a notional thing. This is just kind of you know a, a cartoon version of it, showing where different voltage levels on your power system may have integration challenges with different classes of electric vehicles and the different number of them. And the big thing you see is as the voltage goes lower, that kind of red area where there's impacts are, will kick in a lot earlier. And this kind of highlights how this is a very complex problem and it'll require, of course, more in-depth analysis than we're going into on this webinar, where for one system, they may be able to be integrated, no problem at all, the next one may have aging or already failing infrastructure and adding EVs onto that will just make it worse. So the hope is to kind of highlight these two tools and then other aspects that can help you figure out where those issues might be and how to mitigate them. And kind of some other things on top of the grid capacity are just you know, the, the actual EV adoption behaviors. So we're talking about these different EVs coming online on the system, but how they how quickly they come online is going to vary from region to region and the idea is to kind of give you these tools so you can tweak those numbers maybe get a feel for you know what's our 10-year prediction 
or if that 10-year prediction is much less than we thought it was, what do we have to do there in terms of maybe thinking about capital investments or how to handle that problem? But the overall idea here is to try to make the grid site as perfect of a partner as possible. The nice little text down the bottom of, we want to be able to integrate this and we want to be able to work as a partnership, as Chris mentioned, both with the uh, DOE, the Department of Transportation, the, the local utilities, everything of that nature. Next slide, please. So we'll go over EVI ProLite, and as the subtext there talks about, this is mostly looking at how many charging stations are needed for a particular deployment. Go to the next slide. So what is EVI ProLite? Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, this is a self-service tool, and its primary role is to do a projection analysis on the number of EV charging stations you may need for a particular fleet of electric vehicles, a particular size, as well as give you some kind of exemplary load profiles for a specific region or a specific city. The idea being that if you're going to deploy a lot of electric vehicles, that may help you when you're planning to know what type of charging strategy you may need to deploy or how much it may impact your local kind of distribution and sub-transmission grids. Uh, the big thing it incorporates are the existing charging stations deployed. It gives some statistics on that, some information. Basically, so when it does its projection numbers, you can see what's currently deployed, see if maybe you're already meeting it or if there are any implications there. And the underlying simulation and the underlying tool does include a lot of different data sets. It has some drive-in usage patterns from simulation, some public data sets from like the Department of Transportation, as well as some commercial data sets on kind of EV usage and driving cycles. Next slide. So the first item we're going to go over is basically the charging station count. This is one of the two tools built into EVI Pro Lite. And as mentioned on the prior slide, it basically gives you a high-level estimate of the number of public charging stations or ports needed for a particular EV population. And on the right-hand side is kind of the configuration screen you see related to that. It allows you to kind of put in some high-level variables and get, a, get different projections associated with that system. So you can see over there, one of the big ones, of course, is the number of electric vehicles on the system, which is the circled number on the right-hand side there. Um, this particular case is doing 10% of the light duty fleet, but maybe you have kind of a more conservative prediction, or maybe you have a more ambitious prediction. Uh, just adjusting that and seeing how the numbers will change. The other thing it includes is kind of the fleet composition there. So you can see it's got 1% each for the two plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and then 30% 100 mile range and 68% 250 mile range. This case was obviously focused more on kind of newer EVs, longer range EVs, and how they might need to be charged. I, I will caveat here real quick that if you do use this tool, you cannot put zero in any of those boxes, otherwise you won't get any results. That's why there's 1% for the two PHEV ones. Uh, and then down below, you can kind of indicate some of the more of the charging profile habits. In this particular case, we weren't counting plug-in hybrid electric vehicles just because they were so small batteries and we mostly wanted to focus on newer EVs. And then for the kind of factoring in uh, multi-unit dwelling or kind of more urban charging, saying that only 70% of drivers will have access to home charging. The rest of them will have to use public infrastructure. Next slide, please. So after you put all that in and hit the uh, calculator recalculate button, you'll see results similar to what's on the bottom. Now these are actually two different results. Uh, and these were in the state reports that everybody has seen. The left-hand side is kind of a more conservative prediction. That was where we took a, uh, an exponential growth rate um, based off of the past three years and then extrapolated it out a year or two. And then the right-hand side is doing just 10% of the current light duty fleet. So you can see that impacts things quite a bit. Uh, the big thing to look at here is one, the actual count of the, the public level two and the public DC fast charging. But the other aspect that might especially be useful, especially for things like the, the NEVI proposals, as you can see, it gives the number of current plugs and then the number of plugs per charging station. And with like the NEVI proposals, you see there's the, uh, the four plugs at 150 kilowatts each for 600 kilowatts total. You could look at this and see, you know, 780 plugs with 3.4 plugs. Well, that's probably not meeting the NEVI criteria, but that, that tells you it's at least close and that'll come down to the individual locations, which the tool then has a link where you can look up where those charging stations are actually at as well as some alternative uh, fuels like hydrogen and everything that are less relevant to this particular report, but also still useful to get. Uh, next slide, please. So the other aspect that's inside EVI ProLite that's 
fairly useful, especially for kind of local distribution planning, is it can generate a, a sample load profile for the charging only. And this is basically just associated with the electric vehicles within that city um, or that locale. You can, you know, adjust the numbers and kind of do some interpretation if you wanted to do through traffic, but it's showing more of that local impact. And the idea is to let you kind of, one, see how the different projections might impact your load, as well as look at things like, say, peak demand. If you have to do any type of planning associated with that, maybe you want to look at some non-wire solutions to kind of defer your capital costs, basically to give you some more information of what you might be looking at. And the right-hand side, it's a little hard to see, but it'll blow up as we go through here, is all of the different parameters you can tweak to get that. Uh, if you hit the next button here, Chris. So the first one you see is, once again, just kind of the vehicle size or the vehicle fleet size. Uh, this particular example was for Seattle. So you can see it gives you some information on the number of plug-in vehicles already in the Seattle area as of 2018. Uh, you can adjust that number on the initial slide of this. It'll tell you kind of how many vehicles are in the Seattle area. So you can make a guess of how many would be 10% or uh, if there's a particular penetration range you're going for. Uh, next slide. So the next aspect on here are kind of the environment and climate conditions and drive distance. This mostly factors in in terms of how much the batteries are being depleted, uh, what kind of charging habits those vehicles are going to need to have, as well as, you know, if it's a milder climate, maybe the battery degradation isn't as bad or they're not losing as much range uh, due to heating and kind of secondary uh, vehicle loads. And this information is all populated based off the location. You can manually adjust it to look at different scenarios, but this will be auto-populated by the tool using um, various backend databases. Uh, next, click on it. And the bottom item is a lot more of kind of the details of how the vehicles will charge and how the fleet is kind of composed. So you can adjust kind of how many vehicles you expect to be all electric, how many are sedans versus SUVs. That'll basically dictate how big the battery is. And then all of the different charging characteristics, including what type of uh, home charging they have, whether they prefer to charge at home or if they want to use public infrastructure. And then the bottom aspects especially are the charging strategies. And that'll play into the, the next couple slides a little bit more. Basically, how quickly do they start charging and what rate do they start charging? Next slide. So after you've gone through all those different parameters, this is kind of the first output that the load profile section of EVI ProLite will give you. It'll give you the sample charging load profiles for the whole population of vehicles in that city or that area uh, broken down by the different charging types. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is this is a stack plot. So if you look at um, the left-hand one for the weekday electric charge, you see like the home level one and then the home level two. The home level two is stacked on top of the home level one. So it's not reaching a peak of you know, 250 megawatts by itself. It's 250 megawatts of level one plus level two home charging. So that's the way to interpret these. If you're interested in the overall peak load, you basically have to trace the very top image or the very top curve, which is the DC fast. The, the big aspect here is you can see how there's kind of a, a difference between the weekend versus weekday drive cycles. This will be influenced by whether you had work charging on or not. And you can see kind of where there might be a lot more demand on the weekend for the DC fast charging, just because people are going out, they might be traveling more, maybe they're trying to top off before a long trip, things of that nature. Next slide, please. So the other aspect that EVI ProLite lets you do is it lets you kind of compare these different load profiles for different charging scenarios. And that was kind of that bottom blue box on one of the earlier slides. It defaults to do starting charging immediately, finish as soon as possible. So you get kind of a distributed arrival rate on your vehicles. Uh, you could change that to be kind of more the time of use type one where everybody synchronizes and starts charging at midnight. And that's kind of the worst case scenario on here. That's that uh, olive-ish cur curve that jumps all the way up to 1.8 gigawatts. Uh, clearly that would have some infrastructure uh, implications. Or you can do kind of a, a more slow burn charging rate where they start charging immediately, but they only charge as fast as they need to to meet their departure time. And that basically spreads it out a lot more, reduces your peak demand. Uh, maybe you could leverage other resources on your system. Just gives you some ideas of kind of what either non-wires or capacity kind of upgrades you might need to accommodate for different strategies. And I believe at this point, I'll hand it over to uh, Jim to talk about the EZMT portion. Thank you, Frank. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
today I'll be talking about the energy zones mapping tool and um, it's also featured in these reports um, and uh, it um, is also a, a free online self-service analysis tool and uh, the, the key thing it has uh, it's a it's a mapping tool um, so it has quite a large database that originated with um, kind of a power plant analysis and uh, it's been around for around 10 years so uh, there's quite a large uh, database that's uh, been built over time and um, a unique feature of it is its ability to model on screen areas that meet a, a whole set of user specified criteria next slide please uh, so I'm not going to go through all these questions but if you scan them you'll see uh, most of these are locational um, uh, questions um, and they are or, or querying data that is present in the tool. Um, so when you've, you've created a model, you can compare sites um, based on you know, the results of the model, or you can examine some of the siting factors directly and uh, compare sites. Um, there are a lot of equity considerations in the current um, federal priorities. And um, so another aspect is to take a look at um, locations that you might have chosen for charging and um, to see if they're meeting some of the equity objectives of, of the funding that you may be using for this work. Next slide, please. So some of the mapping content is listed here. Um, much of that is featured in the reports and um, with a few additional ones, for example, the household transportation energy burden um, that's, a, that's a measure of the kind of the household cost um, of transportation energy. Um, and uh, there's also a transit, transit desert index that gets at areas that are, do not have as many transportation options. Um, yeah, but um, the real thing is um, it's, a, it's a very rapid and, and uh, insightful way to take a look at what's currently existing in terms of planning corridors, uh, the stations along the corridors, and uh, some of the electrical infrastructure surrounding the corridors. Next slide, please. So just to, uh, part of the intention of the maps in the report are to illustrate um, what you can access in the tool. So I just chose a, a report, um, in this case, Virginia, that's the state, the first state map in the, the Virginia report, and uh, tried to adjust the map in the EZMT to be similar. Uh, so it, it's not uh, graying out the adjacent states, it's a continuous map. However, um, the same layers are present. And um, these, uh, these layers can also be downloaded if you have your own geographic information system or, or other uh, tools to use the data you can you can download the, the content. Next slide, please. Um, the key thing is EZMT is interactive. So here, even with the just the basic map content that's in the reports, uh, you could uh, zoom in on an area of interest and take a, a close look at it. And then you can um, query the map itself to look up information. So in this example, um, we're, we're just looking up one of the substations to determine its voltage level and some other details about it. Um, next slide, please. And then here, um, you know, just side by side, the same location viewed in the EZMT. Um, down at that lower left part of the panel there, you, you can see the base map um, toggle and you can, um, you can switch to an aerial photography base map. So that's what's done there for the for the background. And then um, in the report we annotated some of the features on the map to just um, point them out. And um, you know, because we had 51 of these to generate on three topics, um, we did automate some of the the text and, and the uh, the information at the left um, with code. Um, but you can use the tool to look up these sorts of um, details about a site of interest um, that you see in the EZMT. 
especially in pairing with other tools like uh, Google Maps or Street View, uh, which we provided those links in the report so you can zoom directly to the location on the map. Next slide, please. Um, so going on to the model, you know, that was really the, the mapping. It's, it's very uh, straightforward and um, intuitive, I would say. Uh, the models take a little bit more thought and um, the key um, the key concept here is that you have a set of sighting criteria that you identify and you can you can start with the models as we pre-configured them um, they're really just a starting point and then you can refine them to meet your needs um, if you like you can even design models from scratch using the tool and um, due to the power plant and the prior Use, uses and, and work on the EZMT, there's over 95 mapping layers from um, modeling layers in the EZMT that you can use. Um, the output of the models is a heat map um, and it just uh, helps direct your attention to areas that meet all the criteria well or don't. And it's a very, very powerful way to, to um, rapidly screen locations. Next slide, please. And you know these are this, some of this text is right in the report, but uh, the main point is that this is a tool, self-service tool, and um, we're trying to illustrate how the tool works, and not to suggest answers that you would use for your planning. So it's really important, you know, for example, if you're using the model. Um, that you take a look at the settings that it has and consider them against your own needs and, and adjust accordingly. Um, and then once you have, you know, areas uh, highlighted on the map that meet those criteria, there's there's many other considerations that need to be um, looked at before you would actually say, yeah, that's the location where this charging station should be sited. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the dialogue at the bottom there, and note the, the four, um, it's an iterative process to, to look, look at the results of the model, make some adjustments, and, um, and then try again until you hone down to, to what you want. Um, but this model has five criteria in it. We want to be near corridors, so it's focusing on corridor charging. Um, we're looking for opportunities to fill gaps here. Um, so in our analysis, we looked for areas that were distant from existing charging locations, in particular DC fast charging. Um, and we're trying to illustrate how um, you know, areas uh, within disadvantaged communities or tribal areas that might um, have some advantages for funding. Um, you know, were we able to find otherwise suitable areas that were also um, funding had funding advantages. And then, um, especially for DC fast charging, um, larger substations would be quite important for um, proximity so you can um, handle that load. And then population density you can use to, you know, select urban areas or rural areas. And in this case, we did um, lean toward a higher population uh, so that we could um, correlate that with higher um, numbers of vehicles. Next slide, please. Jim, uh, this is Chris. Just if I could chime in, is that this is the, the powerful part that I wanted to try to bring home to the, to the participants on this webinar is that, you know, we have those weighting factors there on the side, is that if you want a different weighting scenario, is that you want to overemphasize um, distance from other charging inf stations or things like that, is that you can just walk into a model like this and change the weighting factors to something that that favors your your system that that takes a look at your priorities, and so really it's sort of we're just doing the template example in the hopes that you know departments of transportation, regulatory bodies, and other folks just move in uh, and and take over the tool and put their own preferences in it, and that's that's sort of the power of of what we're trying to convey here. So I'll go to the next slide, Jim. Yeah, exactly. 
And so this is an example of one of the model outputs and um, you know, zoom, zoom to this location and um, it's a little hard to see, but there are several substations within that uh, red area. Um, the hatching indicates that it's within um, a designated um, underserved community um, with funding advantages. Um, the corridor line, you know, the corridors uh, going straight through that parcel. Um, and according to the other criteria in the model, it also has higher population density. And um, I forgot the fifth characteristic, but it meets all of those characteristics at the top level. Um, so that would be just a first step. And what we typically would do in, in preparing the reports was to inspect these areas and um, work side by side with Google Maps, for example, um, to see what infrastructure there was there already. Um, were there, um, obviously it needs an exit um, to, to access those and other characteristics that would appear to be a, an opportunity for a potential uh, site. Oh, and the, the other criteria is it's distant from existing charging locations. So um, we did look for, for these spots along corridors um, that will need additional stations to be added before they can be designated as an EV corridor, fully designated. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things, you know, as I mentioned, the EZMT has been around for 10 years. Um, a lot has happened over that time, not just data updates and, and new um, interests and new priorities, but also just um, web technologies and interfaces and things like that. A lot of lesson learned on our part. Um, so we're close to releasing a new, um, new version of the EZMT, which will also be rebranded as GEM. Um, one thing it's just going to be a little easier to remember. Um, so it'll have the same mapping content and and the modeling capability, but it will be much easier to, to learn and use. And one of the extra steps that we're you know finding a lot of um, time consuming and some frustration with is the res registration and user account. So we've designed it so it, you, it doesn't require you to um, register, you just launch it. Uh, so that lower left panel in GEM, um, those mapping themes, uh, you'll be able to just have a single click to bring up a map that's um, with the particular content related to that theme already loaded. So um, that's one of the most time consuming parts of getting started with the EZMT is finding the data, bringing it up on the map and adjusting the map the way you'd like. So we've tried to streamline that and uh, we think that'll be a very useful uh, change for it. Uh, so we'll announce that and existing EZMT users, you know, we'll, we'll um, make sure it's clear that you can um, continue using EZMT, but you'll be able to find GEM uh, as soon as it's launched, and we hope that you'll find it useful. For both these tools, uh, we welcome your comments and input, and they're all a work in progress. So if you have some good ideas for how we can make it more useful for your analysis, we're very interested in that. And um, that's all I have for this part, but I welcome your questions.